All right, welcome to B-Sides. Uh, today's talk, SHA-1, Backdooring and Exploitation by Jean-Philippe Amosan. All right, thank you for the introduction. <clears throat> okay, good morning. Um, bonjour. <laughs> so, um, I announced this talk a couple of weeks ago. I said uh, this could be exclusive for B-Sides. The talk got rejected from Black Hat and DEF CON. Um, they told me it was kind of too technical, so I don't know what it means, but well, here I am. And yesterday night, I flight from uh, from Switzerland. Uh, I was really tired, but I couldn't sleep. And at 4 a.m., I was still, you know, eyes wide open. Um, so I published something on Twitter, and then I created a website for this project, and I published all the details, the papers, and even the slides. So I don't know how many of you have already seen the slides and the details of, the, of this work. No one? Okay, really good. Yeah. Okay. So I'm giving this talk, but I'm not the only contributor. Actually, I'm not the main contributor of this talk. Um, the, my friends from Graz, from um, this university in Austria, uh, Maria, Florian, and Martin, they did most of the um, most of the work, let's say, all the cryptanalysis work. Uh, they're from TU Graz. Uh, Angel Bertini, which is the guy who did this uh, fancy logo, he worked on the uh, binary, kun binary kung fu, all this binary stuff, and I did what I call the theory, so the initial ideas and the marketing things. Okay. So I have three main parts in this talk. The first one, so what, what is hash function backdoor? It's about backdoors. You know what a crypto backdoor is, what a cipher backdoor is. Okay, you can sabotage cipher, but it's not really straightforward to define what is a hash function backdoor. So I briefly talk about this. Then I explain how we backdoor chat one, and then how we exploited this backdoor. Um, if you want to leave the room now, okay, this is what we found, two images with the same hash. Okay, I'll give you the, the details. So who is interested in crypto backdoors? Um, I hope all of you. Uh, you might know about um, an, organization, an organization called NSA, National Security Agency. Uh, they've been in the news lately. Um, <laughs> and they have this kind of interesting document. They created a cipher called Duality. Uh, I won't give the details, but it's something based on elliptic curves. And some people argue that it's been backdoored by NSA. Uh, it's a complicated story, but well, they've been interested in backdoors uh, since at least 1993 with this clipper chip. Um, some people will say it's not a backdoor, it's a bit different, it's key is crawl, but you know, at the end of the day it's the same, they got your keys. Um, did crypto researchers pay attention to, um, to crypto backdoors and to hash, fu hash function backdoors? Uh, so you might know that the cryptographic community is doing lots of papers, lots of research in very sophisticated things, a lot of mathematics. Uh, but not much about, um, let's say, offensive crypto. Not much about backdoors. Uh, it's not completely true. There's two guys, Moti Ying and Adam Young, who did this crypto virology project a couple of years ago. Uh, it was very interesting, um, really good ideas. Um, they had some black box ciphers, some backdoor ciphers, but it's not the ideal backdoor you can imagine because it's a black box. You don't see the specs and tell you there's a, the cipher text is leaking key bits. But if you see the internals, if you see how the algorithm is working, you will see the backdoors will be in front of your eyes. Okay. There's been much more work about uh, hardware backdoors. So in the integrated search circuit, how to, put, how to put a backdoor, they call it Trojan. So it works in how to insert a backdoor and how to detect a backdoor. On the uh, hash function side, so I've been doing this, uh, this paper in 2011. And I was you know, really excited. Yeah, let's do hash function backdoors. Uh, had some crazy ideas. But I really failed to make something interesting, make something exploitable. So it was printed at a workshop, but not really, um, not really what I imagined. So what's a crypto backdoor? It's not, uh, first of all, it's not an implementation backdoor. A crypto, what I mean by crypto backdoor is something in the, in the pseudo code, in the algorithm, in the math, not in the code. All right. You might know this example of RSA. So I don't know if you see the backdoor here. Um, of RSA, RC4, sorry. RC4. RC4 is pretty simple, it's just swapping bytes. And there's an interesting backdoor here. I don't know if you, if you see, I don't know, maybe some of you know the, know the trick. Okay, I highlighted some lines in the red so that you easily find the, the thing. So here we are. Um, we get a byte, we get another byte, and we swap uh, two elements of the array A. And these guys, they are pretty clever. They don't use the simple swap there, use the XOR, the XOR swap so that you don't have to use the buffer, you XOR, you XOR X with Y and Y with X and X with Y and you permit the two values. Okay, but the problem here is that if you swap A, I and AJ using this trick, 
then if you have i equal j, if you have the same index, you will set your state to zero. So instead of having random values in your internal state, you will have only zeros. And as you know, the old zero generator is not good to the random generator. Okay. Um, what's a backdoor is not a trapdoor. So a trapdoor is overt, you know that there's something, you know that there's a secret that if you know you can invert a function, a backdoor is covered. It's not supposed to be there. All right. So RSA, the RSA function has a trapdoor, which is the private key. NSA has backdoors, and RSA has NSA backdoors as well. And you have a function called VSH, very smooth hash, which is a trapdoor hash function. It's interesting because it's based on the RSA function, so on big numbers arithmetic. And if you know the secret, if you know the private key, if you know the factorization of the big number, then you can find collisions efficiently. And what it demonstrates is that if you don't know the secret, you cannot find collision unless you break RSA. All right. Now what about backdoors? Um, so I want this uh, informal definition. It's some secret property that will allow you to efficiently break the hash. So what does it mean to break a hash function? Um, so it can be about collisions. So I think two messages that give the same hash, pre-images inverting the hash function, or something less powerful, maybe finding a distinguisher. I don't know. And now how do you modelize how do you formalize this backdoor? Because in crypto, to start studying things, we need to have strong definitions. We need to have useful definitions. Otherwise, we can't make anything useful. And once you construct this sabotage hash function, how do you exploit it? So maybe you, you will create a hash function for which you know one collision, and nobody else will be able to find this collision. But you just know one stupid collision. Not You cannot generate random collisions. But you can imagine more powerful backdoors where you can generate as many collisions as you want or you can generate as many pre-images, you can invert the function on any image. So you have different levels of hash function backdoors. And when we try to formalize this, um, as we do in crypto in terms of uh, attackers and defenders, you said that we sort of inverse the roles. Here, so if the bad guy, which is usually the bad guy, she's now the designer. She creates the crypto, she defines the ciphers, and she wants to defend her backdoor. Whereas the good guys, what we call Alice and Bob usually, they are the users, and we want to fool them. We want to convince them that there is no backdoor, that the function is safe, and in case they suspect the backdoor, we don't want them to recover the backdoor and to exploit, to exploit it. Okay. So I won't go into all the details. You can look this up in the paper, but just very briefly, we define a malicious hash function as a pair of two algorithms. The first one is generate. So we take some randomness, some seed, some whatever, and we generate a hash function, so some piece of code or pseudocode, and a backdoor. So the backdoor can be a number, can be a string, can be whatever. And then we have the exploit function, which takes this function h, the backdoor, and optionally a challenge. So the challenge might be an image if you want to invert a hash function. And if you have the backdoor, then you can exploit it and solve the problem, so find collisions or invert the function. All right, so we define two notions, static or dynamic. It's a bit boring, so you can look at this in the paper, but we have, uh, for example, static collision backdoors. In what I mentioned before, you just know one stupid collision. You have dynamic collision backdoors. It's more interesting, you can generate as many collisions as you want, or a lot of them. Static pre-image is that uh, you cannot really invert a function in a natural sense, but you can sort of invert. You can generate a hash value, which is, for example, the old zero string, or something that looks a bit suspicious. Now we have to define stuff. So how strong is the backdoor in terms of um, detectability? So first of all, you want to hide the backdoor. So given the hash function, the good guys, they should not be able to spot the backdoor or to have a suspicion of a backdoor. And in case they know or they're told that there's a backdoor, then we don't want them to discover it. So we have this notion of discoverability. If you give them the hash and how it works, to exploit it, or to exploit the backdoor, they should not be able to recover the backdoor. Okay. So that's for the theory, and our results are what I call dynamic collision backdoor and detectable, but not undiscoverable. So that's a bit boring. So let's move to SHA-1. Um, so have you heard about SHA-1? Yeah. A bit less popular than MD5, but uh, no, it's used everywhere today. Uh, it was designed by, uh, by these guys again, NSA, standardized by, by NIST. So it was designed in 1995. Well, the design was published in 1995. 
and it's used yeah, almost everywhere. So in RSA or AEP for encryption, in what is called RSA with SHA-1, Science Insurance, HMAC, PBKDF2 for key derivation, password hashing. So you see, H you see SHA-1 in TLS, SSL, in uh, SSH, IPsec, and many, many more protocols. Uh, it's used for integrity check, so in uh, something like Git and bootloaders to, uh, for code verification, uh, in host-based uh, IDSs, and for file integrity monitoring to make sure that the files haven't been modified. Uh, how it works? So I could present you 10 slides we're giving all the details, but you don't need to know the details about SHA-1, just very briefly. What it does, it's just a bunch of additions, XORs, actually not additions, yeah, XORs, and shifts and rotations. That's pretty simple. And it uses four constants. So you see the, the XORs here, uh, the logical and the logical negation, and 5AA27999, 6ED9EBA1, 8F1BBCDC, and CA62C1D6. So do you see what this means? Do you know what those constants are? Oh, wait. Square root of two, square root of three, square root of five, and square root of ti 10, multiplied by two to the 32, and uh, to take the first 30, 32, 32 bits. Uh, they use these constants to um, sort of bring some non-zero values, because if you don't add any, um, any random looking numbers, then you have some symmetry, you have some structure in the uh, cipher, and it's sometimes a little bit easier to break. And they use different constants for different for each of the four rounds because they want the rounds to be different. Because if the rounds are similar, then some attacks might or might not be possible. Okay. So look at these constants. Um, so Shawin is broken. So Bruce and I told it, so let's trust him. Uh, but it's not that broken. Like I said, it's used everywhere. So if it were that broken, uh, we would be some we'd be using something different maybe. Um, what they mean by broken is that for cryptographers, as soon as you find an attack that is a little bit faster than the generic one, then you call it a break. What's interesting is that they have collision attacks that have complexity approximately 2 to the 60, 2 to the 64. We don't really know. Some people try to verify this. They, and they set up a cluster of computers, they implement the attack, they optimize it, and so on. And they're in for a month, they were very optimistic. Yeah, we're going to find a collision. So they waited, they waited, they waited. And no collision. Um, so the details of why it didn't work are not very clear, but they may have uh, underestimated the cost of the attack. But what is pretty sure is that there's a way to find collisions much, much faster, a thousand times faster than, than it should be. Okay. So the recommendation is not to use one today, but of course nobody cares because they don't have a collision. So I will briefly describe the techniques that we use to uh, to find collisions. So it's based on the uh, state-of-the-art differential attacks. Uh, here you have the message expansion. You take a, s a small block of message, 5 12 bits, and you expand it to something but much bigger. And this much bigger thing, you will process it using the operations I showed before, the exhaust and rotation and so on, using the constants. So the little blue squares here are the differences. We have two different messages. And they have only tiny differences, maybe one bit, maybe two bits, three bits. And here it's the internal state on the right. So the first step is the, the top, and the last step is the, is the bottom. And you see how the difference propagates. So at the beginning, you have very few differences, and you have many, many more. And then it sort of vanishes. So what does it mean what, when differences completely vanish? It means that you enter the same state. In other words, that you have a collision. What do you want? The difficult thing is that it's very, very difficult to predict how differences propagate because of what we call nonlinearity. If everything is linear, it's completely predictable. You know the difference, the input difference, you can determine deterministically the output difference. So what we do is um, we show one is first find what we call differential, differential characteristic. It just means a way, a pattern of propagation. So the way we do it is we imagine that it's predictable. We imagine that it's completely linear. And then we compute the probability that the nonlinear stuff behaves linearly. And once we find this uh, pattern of propagation that would give us collision, we try to find a message that will satisfy this propagation and, call and give us collision. Um, that's the details of the pattern we found. Here we have many, many differences, so it's extremely, extremely low probability, uh, much lower than 2 to the minus 40. Uh, it's extremely low. But the trick we use is that we use some automated techniques, some automated search techniques to find a message 
um, that matches the differences so that we don't have to brute force it. So this comes essentially for free. We satisfy all the security difference pattern essentially for free. And then at this step, this step, it's a bit more difficult. We cannot modify the message because we, we found a message that satisfies the constants here. So what can we modify? Not a message, we modify the constants. Um, so the first step is what I just described. For the second round, we will try all the 2 to the 32 constants K2 until one gives us uh, what we want. So a good propagation of differences. And we sort of repeat the same thing iteratively for all the, all the three steps. So you might notice that here we don't modify K1. The first constant is completely untouched. It's the same as the original one. And then we will modify the next, the next uh, three constants. So the total cost of the attack is approximately 2 to the 48. Uh, it took us, uh, if I remember correctly, a couple of hours on, on the cluster we used. But 2 to the 48 is relatively, relatively small in terms of, of uh, computation search. Okay, and we had a collision, so you had to trust me that uh, this works. But if you take the original initial value of SHA-1, if you modify the constants, so you see it's different from the original one, it's, not, it's no longer a square root of whatever, and you take these two messages with this difference pattern, you get the same hash. So we have a collision, not for SHA-1, but for a slightly modified version of SHA-1. What's pretty cool too is that if you take the uh, state-of-the-art collision attacks on the original SHA-1, they use two blocks. So SHA-1 would hash the first block and then the second one, and you would only have a collision after two blocks. Here we have a collision after just one block. All right, so it's pretty useless. You see it looks like uh, garbage bytes. You, you don't see how, how to exploit this. Um, and it's not a real SHA-1, so you would say, okay, your equation is useless and it's on, not on the real SHA-1, so what is it use, useful for? Um, so I don't know if you've already seen this kind of thing, but I have seen many cases, well, many cases, a couple of cases where um, customers of some encryption um, or some security company say, yeah, we want our uh, personal as crypto. We, will, we don't want the same crypto as uh, those guys uh, because uh, we're paranoid or we just don't understand things. So we want different constants. We want different boxes. We want different uh, whatever. And sometimes people do modify the standards. So they want the customer that sort. So you're no longer compliant because it does not match the official specs, but you will have your very own version of SHA-1 or AES. So I don't know, that's one of the motivation, motivation for this work. You design your custom SHA-1, you can sabotage it. Okay. And how to turn this garbage collision into useful collision? So not just two sequences of random bytes, but two actual files of some given format. You might think about images, documents, uh, PDF or whatever. So the basic idea that is quite agnostic to the file format we'll use is to construct messages as follows. So here you have M1 and M2, which will be the different, the first block. They will be different because we need differences to get a collision. And we'll create M1 and M2 in such a way that semantically they instruct the, the program, so which might be the command interpreter, the image viewer, or the CPU. Uh, in the case of M1, to jump here and start executing the first payload. And in the case of M2, we will completely discard the first payload and execute the second one. So you might see as a simple, uh, if I'm M1, then go to payload one. If I'm M2, go to payload two. And that's actually what, um, what we did with the shell script example I'll show later. But it's not so easy because we have constraints. The differences cannot be fully controlled. We have to have some differences at I don't know, maybe the, the third bit or the 23rd bit. So we can't do everything we want. And a big problem is that in many file formats, you have these magic signatures at the beginning. The first four bytes have to be a given value. And what really sucks here is that because of the cohesion attack, uh, we have to have differences in these first four bytes. So we cannot find uh, adamant collisions for file formats that impose a magic signature of four bytes out of set zero. But as you will see later, there are some file formats where this signature can be later in the file at another offset. Okay. Uh, okay, so maybe the most interesting would be P is portable executable files, though Windows executables, for example. Uh, it doesn't work because um, there's the entry point that is encoded somewhere here. And because of our differential pattern, we have to have a difference at this point, which means that this would create a file of more than one gig 
and this could not be supported by Windows. So we can't find collisions for PEs, we can't find collisions for ELF, uh, uh, neither macro, uh, macro files. Um, not today, and maybe if you find a better differential characteristic, we may or may not be able, but um, yeah. sorry, this doesn't work at the moment. Something that works is uh, shell scripts. So this is completely trivial. You just put some uh, sharp symbol, uh, so it's a comment in a shell script, and then you can put whatever you want, not only printable characters, but any arbitrary bytes. So you will have differences in this, in this step. And then you can have just a normal shell script where you say, uh, if my first byte is like this, then execute this, this command, and if my first byte is like that, then do something evil. So we have this example. In this first version, we start uh, with, a, with a sharp, and we have 0a at, uh, at this line. So when we execute it, we have this, this, this animal here. And the second one is just a little bit different, you see? There's a couple of differences, but we still have the, uh, the sharp, and it puts hello world. So what's cool here, it can be hello world, it can be a, a co, it can be a deer, it can be a dog, it can be everything. Uh, it can be execute uh, this program, it can be launch your internet browser, it can be your RM minus RF. So um, that's pretty cool. But if you look at the shell code, it will be straightforward that you have this, this if statement, if OD minus blah, 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 blah. blah. So the backdoor is clear, not um, undetectable here. Okay, what about uh, archives? So I'm not speaking about zip because it doesn't work for zips, but for RAR and 7Z formats, what's pretty cool is that, like I said, the signature doesn't have to be at the first, at the zero offset. So we can have the signature later and start with some garbage that will include our differences. So the idea is, uh, is as follows. We have two, um, two files, so one file here, one file there. So in the first one, it will be sort of corrupted. It will not look like a RAR, so the parser will continue looking for valid RAR archives until it finds RAR2. In the second case, it will look like a valid archive at the, at the beginning, so it will execute RAR1. And again, what's very cool is that you can put whatever you want in RAR1 and RAR2. So it works exactly the same for, uh, for 7Z. Uh, common BR, so master brute records and com files, so maybe not the most used uh, executables today, but what's fun is that there's no signatures at all. You can, the first byte can be a byte of code. So it really starts with x86 code. So here the idea is, uh, again, to use a jump instruction to jump at different offsets and to control this jump based on the differences imposed by the attack, which where it works like this. Jump address one, jump address two, and we have two different payloads that, again, we can completely control. Uh, JPEG is a bit different because it's not code executed like in the uh, previous example. Um, and there's a two-byte signature. So you have a sequence of, of chunks in the JPEG format. And what we do is that the first chunk will be commented by one of the, um, one of the, one of the two files. So it will not be recognized by the image viewer. Whereas in the second case, it will not be commented and it will be processed. So it will allow you to make, to put two different images in the same file. Um, that technical data, I don't think it's very, very clear, so I will, I'll skip it, but you can get something like this, and you said they have um, exactly the, the same the same hash. Okay. And again, we can put uh, any images. I was told it was not cool to put uh, images of uh, RSA company here, but uh, yeah, I don't care. Um, now polyglot, so that's even cooler. So the, um, what I showed before is that you construct a sabotage SHA-1, and you can find uh, colliding shell scripts. Or you construct another sabotage SHA-1, and you can, you can find colliding JPEGs. But what about if you want to have the same malicious SHA-1 and create both uh, colliding shell scripts, MBRs, and RAR archives? Then you can do it too. And here the trick you use is that the first block will be valid with respect to each of those three formats. So the RAR interpreter will not complain. The, it will, there will be some useful x86 code and the shell script will, um, will interpret it correctly as well. So I call it virtual multi-collisions because out of one instance of SHA-1, you can find many collisions for different file formats. And not just one collision for each type, but many, many collisions for each of the three types. That's pretty useful. Okay. And even more magic, so here we just have two files, 
And depending on the structure of the PDF, so we'll also look at the PDF format, depending on our image viewer, so this is Chrome, this is Sumatra, this is Adobe, they have different definitions of the PDF format, so they will read it a bit differently. Um, so we also took, we took pictures of ran at random, and we have different test scripts, different MBRs, and we, we, we checked it into QME, QME, it, it works well. That's pretty cool. Okay, so you will have more details about this uh, binary thing in a uh, get a fuck off, which will be distributed at DEF CON uh, by Travis Goodspeed and, yeah, thanks Sergey. Uh, we're here, well, a cryptographer and a binary star walk into a bar, so by Ange and, uh, and Maria. They did a really, really good work, so you can get it for free, it will be here on Twitter. So now I'm gonna conclude, I don't know what, what time it is. Yeah, just three minutes left. Okay, so many people ask me, oh, Russia one is broken, uh, what can we do? Should we kill ourselves or, you know? Don't need to worry, uh, it does not affect the security of Shawan at all. Uh, we reuse the IDs of attacks on Shawan. It has three, no implication of the, on the original Shawan. So, so far so good. Don't use Shawan anyway. Uh, so there's always partner with people, you know, uh, Snowden and all this stuff say, ah, but NSA, they use this, they backdoor Shawan, you know, we knew it. Well, uh, I think it's very unlikely that NSA used this trick because first of all, uh, they designed SHA-0 two or three years before SHA-1 and there was a really huge weakness in SHA-0 which suggests that they were not really that smart at that time. Uh, an actual collision for SHA-0 was fine in 1998. Okay. And the techniques that we used, they were discovered only in 2004, 2005, were discovered publicly. Uh, so you can still argue, yeah, but maybe NSA, they knew it. Well, you can still speculate, but I think it's very, very unlikely that they, they did this on SHA-1. Uh, can we do the same for SHA-256? Um, we haven't investigated this. Uh, the good news is that in SHA-256 you have not four constants, but 64 constants. So which gives us many, many more freedom to modify the constants. On the other hand, it means many more differences as well, which may or may not be interesting. What's not so good is that whereas we relied on the collision attacks on the full SHA-1, we cannot rely on collision attacks for the full SHA-2 because there is none. The best known uh, attack is on 35, 31 steps out of 64. So the first step would be to create, to expand this quark, to find uh, characteristics, to find patterns, different propagation patterns for the full SHA-256. I don't know if it's feasible, but we will probably look into it in the next months. So thank you for your attention. I would be happy to take questions. You can go to this web page, myshutalashawan, one, email us, and that's it. Thank you very much. Square root, so the yeah. issues are random, but you can take square root of many, many numbers, of many, you can take a huge database of numbers that look like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it shows a small yeah. Why don't you do that?